good good afternoon well good evening good evening and good morning to um dr patsy iwasaki um so thank you so much uh dr patsy she's going to be our sixth uh, lecture guest speaker in our erasure course um sustainable dialogues and relations with an erasure community in a post covid 19 world and it is a pleasure for me to introduce, as I said, Dr. Patsy Iwasaki. She has a PhD in learning design and technology from the University of Hawaii at Manawa. She also holds a master in education and is an English um, department faculty member at the University of Hawaii at ELO. She is a recipient of the University Chancellor's uh, Award for Excellence in Teaching, the, um, sorry Patsy if I don't pronounce well, uh, Koichi and Tanijo Taniguchi Award for Excellence and Innovation, and other teaching and research awards. Her research interests and teaching practices include instructional design, online course, program development, documentary film research and practice, also English studies, comics, manga, migration narratives, diversity, place, community-based, and culturally relevant resources in education, also cross-cultural exchange and collaboration. Dr. Iwasaki has conducted extensive research activities, published articles, and given presentations in these areas. Today, she's going to give us a lecture titled Japanese Culture Through Migration to the United States. Thank you very much, Dr. Patsy. The floor is yours. Um, so the lecture will be 45, 50 minutes and then 10, 15 minutes for questions and comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Patsy. OK, um, hi, everyone. I'm going to start off by playing this uh, music for you. Can you hear it? Yes. Just a couple more minutes, just a couple more seconds. Okay, um, just playing that a little bit. I hope that brought you a little bit to Hawaii. And um, I hope you enjoyed that little piece of music. It's called Hawaii Pono'i. It was the national anthem of the Kingdom of Hawaii. And the lyrics were composed by King David Kalakaua, whose photo is right there, in 1876 to honor King Kamehameha, the first founder of the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1810. And it continues to be Hawaii's official anthem for the state of Hawaii, even in modern times. Um, next. Okay, my name is Dr. Patsy Iwasaki, and um, I'm at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, as um, Dr. Sotelo has, has uh, introduced me as, and I want to thank you and welcome you to my presentation, Japanese Culture Through Migration to the United States. Although we've spent two years under the heavy shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're very fortunate to have the technology that allows us to share and collaborate across the world. My deepest regards and sympathy goes out to all of you, maybe who are, you know, we're all still dealing with this ongoing pandemic and who may have experienced loss or illness of loved ones due to the virus. So my topic of discussion today covers key points within the migration history from Japan to Hawaii that began over 130 years ago and how that affected cultural sustainability. Next. I'm thankful for this opportunity to share my research and teaching practices with you, despite being thousands of miles away. So let me begin by saying aloha to all of you. Aloha is Hawaiian for hello, hi, it's a greeting, much like hola in Spanish. And let me give you a greeting called the shaka sign. I hope you can see me. It's a hand gesture of friendship 
that like aloha has many meanings such as hello, right on, thank you, take it easy, all very positive. And you know, as you're driving around the roads in Hawaii and someone might be kindly let you go, you know, you're trying to make a turn, then you can just flash a shaka saying, hey, thank you for letting me go in the traffic. <laughs> so a gesture um, that even our 44th president, Barack Obama, who was born and raised in Hawaii, used often to link him to the 50th state of Hawaii. So, hey, every, can everybody do that? Give me a shaka back. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Next, please. I want to thank the Eurasia Foundation, the University of Bogas, and Dr. G Gianna Sotelo for kindly inviting me to take part in this course that seeks to bring diverse perspectives and increase global understanding. I'm so committed. Um, next slide, please. I'm so committed and passionate about cultural sustainability, global education, cross-cultural and multicultural studies, and about building cross-cultural relationships. This COVID-19 pandemic affecting everyone around the world is truly showing us all that you know, we're more similar than different. And although we come from many different backgrounds, cities and countries speak many languages, we truly are one human race living on one single planet Earth. I strongly believe that building relationships, especially multicultural, cross-cultural relationships, is a universal goal that we need to pursue to make this world a sustainable, better home for all of us. And um, I, how many students do we have in here, Gianna? Let's see, uh, there are um, there's going to be 12 and enroll in the course, but um, let's see, right now, I, I can't see right now because I'm sharing the full screen, but there, I, I think there, how many of you right now? I think there are five, six? Okay, okay. Um, you know, um, I was going to do a introduction, um, you know, exercise, but you know, we did get a late start. So, um, you know, maybe we can just condense it, but I just wanted to um, introduce my, you know, myself and I wanted you to introduce yourself, maybe briefly, you know, with your name, major or field, what you're watching, you know, what you're watching now. I want to hear that. Or tell me about your favorite food. So um, I'll go first. Um, okay. uh, so I have many um, fields of interest for this presentation. My interest is migration narratives, especially through graphic novels, culture and cultural sustainability. What I'm watching now, I, are you familiar with this guy? Oh, yes. Yeah, you know? that's Grogan. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. So, so right now I'm watching The Mandalorian, Star Wars, The Mandalorian, and um, you know, in between my busy schedule, and um, and because I'm I'm gonna go first, um, I'm gonna share also my favorite food. So, and uh, so my my favorite food is ice cream. Gosh, let's see, can you see this? And um, or gelato, and um, this Magnum brand is is my favorite right now especially this double chocolate. I love chocolate. This has chocolate ice cream, chocolate ganache swirl, and it's covered with a chocolate shell that you can crack open. It's absolutely heaven. So um, uh, so I don't know if we, do we have time to just quickly go through people's names or, or maybe we should, maybe we should. Yeah, come on, come on. Just, it's, it's going to be very brief. Come yeah, on. Very, give your okay. name, your name. I can see them right now. Okay. Sorry, Patsy. You wanted to finish? Um, yeah, that's it. Just your name, your major, what you're watching, or your favorite food. Okay. Let's see. Come on. Uh, uh, Lydia, you can go first, please. Okay. So, so I'm Lydia Yaviana. Um, uh, I have studied history, but I'm working as an archaeologist. Um, and my favorite food is pasta, <laughs> spaghetti. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Rodrigo? Uh, my name is uh, Rodrigo Sedano. I'm a student in um, the master to become a lawyer. And actually, I'm working as a European project manager in research and innovation. Wow. 
Favorite food? <laughs> oh, favorite food. Sorry for that. Uh, favorite food could be possibly Italian. Mm. Italian also. Ooh, they win. Thank you. Okay. Next, next one, Pablo. Hello, Pablo. You're not there. Uh, okay, Mohamed, can you go? Uh, okay, my name is Mohamed. I am studying here in Spain, uh, science politic, uh, political science, and uh, my favorite food is uh, rice with uh, beef. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay, next one. Laura, please. Uh, I'm Laura. I'm studying business and law. Um, I think I don't have a favorite food because I like cooking too much, so I like everything. Thank you. Oh, I can see with Mohamed there is also uh, uh, Ali. No, uh, sorry for your name. Abdurrahman. Okay, yeah, Abdur but I can't. Yes. Uh, okay. He's another student. Uh, what? You can go ahead, and please. Yeah, my name is Abdurrahman. I study political science. And uh, my favorite food, uh, I love all the food. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good. Very good. Thank you. Okay, next one, uh, David, please. The mic, the mic is. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm David. Uh, I study law and politics, so that's everything. That's all. And, and he's he's not in Spain right now, like he, yeah. like like Eliana. They're both um, international students right now. They are in different countries. They, uh, David is in Crimea, right? And uh, what well, Eliana? I'll, I'll give you the um, well, the, the, Dave, uh, David. You haven't said what is your favorite food. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. Uh, this is a typical one from Cyprus. Okay, very good. It's called bread, so it's really common here. So. All right, nice. Eliana, thank you, David. Eliana. Um, hi, hi, I'm Eliana. I study mechanical engineering. And right now I'm in Seoul. And I like Reese's. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you. Uh, Juan, Juan, you're there. Hello, Juan. Hello, uh, my name is Juan. I'm studying uh, the Master of, uh, of Kamabi, a lawyer, and my favorite food is lamb. All right, thank you. Okay, and um, Pablo, now I can see you're connected now, so... Yeah, 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 it was me. Uh, yeah, my name is Pablo, I study management engineering. Uh, my favorite food is pizza. <laughs> Very good. All right, great. Hey. All right, thank you so much. I just thank feel you. so much more connected to you now, and um, and 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 just I'm just so fantastic. It's just so fantastic that so many all of your all over the world. It's just so amazing. Yeah. So great. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, you can go back to the slide now if we got everybody. Okay, um, the the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, and the next one again. Okay, so my presentation today will focus on the Japanese migration experience to Hawaii using a few major points in history. It will include upon touching upon the Asian American and Pacific Islander current migration issues because the Japanese American experience is part of the entire Asian American and Pacific Islander experience as well. Next slide, please. While many were celebrating the Chinese Lunar New Year and the 2022 Year of the Tiger in early February, violent racist crimes were continuing to be committed against Asian Americans and Pacific Islander Americans in the United States and, and other areas around the world. Um, sli next slide, please. The COVID-19 pan pandemic has directly impacted everyone on this planet and has claimed millions of lives. As I prepared this lecture, the number of deaths has reached over 900,000 in the United States alone, almost 1 million people, the most of any country. Next slide, please. Because the virus has been linked 
to originating in Wuhan, China, some people called it the Chinese virus. And resulting xenophobic, violent behavior have been targeted against Asians and Pacific Islanders soon after the pandemic began in 2020. New York City had an 867% increase in Asian American hate crime in 2020, and San Francisco reported a 567% increase in 2021. A total of 60 victims were reported to police. However, the mayor of San Francisco said the actual numbers are likely higher because people are reluctant. They don't want to report these crimes. The Stop Asian American Pacific Islander Hate Coalition tracked more than 10,000 incidents of hate from March 2020 to September 2021. And I wanted to, if if um, Dr. Sotelo can can play the the video that's there, but just let me say a little bit more about it. Um, so I, I want to show you this short video. Hate crimes are targeting the elderly as well as young females. The most recent cases include two Chinese women in New York City, Michelle Go, who was shoved in front of a subway train in January 2022, and Christine Yuna Lee, who was stabbed to death in her own apartment. So I wonder if you can play that video. Yeah, let me give you that. Uh, I says actors deny. Oh no. Um, have permission to access, that's what he says, on uh, this server. He says that you'll have permission on this uh, server. Right, I see that. Mm. It's, not um, YouTube, it's not on YouTube or anything like that? It is on YouTube, but you know, um, perhaps I could I could just go, go, what do you want me to do? Just go through the slides, maybe? Maybe, and then maybe um, just provide the link to students so they can watch it later, or if we have time, let, watch it at the end? Good idea, good idea. Okay, okay. well, we'll do that because it's, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to, to explain with this video, you know, how migration issues affect us today. Yeah. And, um, and, and these are like violent crimes that are being affected upon, uh, you know, people, you know, because of migration issues. So it's extremely unfortunate and unacceptable around, you know, that these incidents stemming from migration due to social, political, and economic stability in many, instability in many countries are occurring. Yet one of the questions to ask is, you know, how did so many Asians end up in the United States and Hawaii? So um, next slide, please. The push and pull factors of immigration around the world, and especially to the United States during the 1800s, also applied to Hawaii. Factors that you know pushed people to move out of their country called immigration, and factors that pull people to come into a new country, you know, immigration. Environmental, social, economic, and political instability and hopes for a better life pushed residents out of their own countries to America and to Hawaii and, and all around the world, you know, it's still going on today, especially now, you know, with the conflict. And for Hawaii, the need for workers on the sugar plantations pulled immigrants to the islands. Uh, next slide, please. The same environmental, social, economic, and political factors that pushed people out of their home countries in the 1800s are the same reasons that pull migrants in, pulled migrants into a country. The same reasons for migrants still apply today, over 200 years later. Push factors include few services, lack of job opportunities, unhappy life, poor transport links, natural disasters, wars, shortage of food and other reasons. And the pull factors are access to services, better job opportunities, better transport links, improved living conditions, you know, hope for a better life. Everyone is hoping for that. Family links and other reasons. Um, next slide, please. This is why many states in the United States have a diverse population, including Asian Americans from China, Japan, Korean, Korea, the Philippines, Southeast Asian countries, and many other nations, as well as Pacific Islanders. Immigrants were in the past, as they are today, seeking sustainable futures through migration. And actually, you know, I'm finding out that, 
there, there we, we know that there was a significant population from Portugal that arrived into Hawaii. But I'm also learning that there are some Spanish too that came. And I do have to do a little bit more research about that because it's kind of interesting. Um, so it's extremely unfortunate and unacceptable that many Asians are being excluded from society and justice and are targets of hate crimes due to the COVID-19 pandemic and people attaching a Chinese nickname to it. So let me focus on Japanese migration to Hawaii for a little bit right now. Next slide, please. To discuss Japanese migration to Hawaii, I first need to provide a little background. In the 1800s, many countries were interested in gaining political and economic access to the Hawaiian kingdom. And they tried to do so through imperialism and colonization. Russia, England, and especially the United States were interested in Hawaii. As you can see from this map, the Hawaiian islands wanted, uh, you know, are, are in a very strategic position, although very small and tiny, you know, sometimes on maps, there isn't even Hawaii on those maps, you know, because it's so small and tiny. But we are in a very strategic location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The United States wanted a Pacific military base and economic opportunities. And the United States did indeed succeed. A military base was established at Pearl Harbor on Oahu in 1887, and it became the most important American naval base in the Pacific and home to the US Pacific Fleet. Um, next slide, please. Another success for the United States came a few years later. Um, I say especially for the United States. Um, it was a success for the United States, maybe not, not necessarily for um, the Kingdom of Hawaii. A group of American sugar barons and businessmen successfully overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy with a coup. The overthrow of Hawaii's last queen, Queen Liliokalani, came in 1893. A year later, the Republic of Hawaii was established in 1894 under President Sanford Dole, one of the leaders of the coup. And four years later, in 1898, Hawaii was annexed to the United States as an incorporated territory. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> I want to share an interesting story between Hawaii and Japan. King Kalakaua was the reigning monarch in the Kingdom of Hawaii from 1871 to 1891. In 1881, King David Kalakaua traveled all around the world to Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. His travels brought the small island nation that no one knew about to the attention of world leaders, but it also sparked rumors that the kingdom was for sale. This king is the one who wrote the lyrics to the Hawaii national anthem I played for you at the very beginning. Next slide, please. And King Kalakau also visited Japan for two weeks. Many say he was trying to deflect America's ambitions towards Hawaii and possibly place Hawaii under the empire of Japan's protection. So he proposed a marriage between his niece, Crown Princess Kayulani, with Prince Higashi Fushimi Yorihito. While the proposal fell through, it's interesting to think about the possibilities if Hawaii had come under Japanese rule. Next, next. And in addition to being the first king to circumnavigate around the world, King Kalakaua's global tour also had an economic purpose. He was being pressured by sugar plantation owners to find, to find additional labor sources for the extremely lucrative sugar industry that was booming in Hawaii at the time. Growing, harvesting, and processing sugarcane was very labor intensive. Here is King Kalakaua seated right in the middle with, the, with Japanese officials to the left and right, and standing in the back are members of the king's delegation. Next. Why was the sugarcane industry so lucrative for the sugar barons? The Reciprocity Treaty of 1875 was a free trade agreement between the United States and the Hawaiian Kingdom that guaranteed a tax-free market for Hawaiian sugar to the United States in exchange for economic privileges and the coveted naval base at Pearl Harbor. So, and also around this time, the Civil War prevented sugar from southern states to go to the northern states. This immigrant force that was successfully recruited from Asian countries such as China, Japan, Korea, and the Philippines is what created the multicultural society of Hawaii that we have today.
At first glance, you can understand why so many Japanese and other migrants from Asia would want to immigrate to Hawaii. Japan and other economies were in a recession, rice harvests were poor, and many residents thought they might do better in Hawaii. Most of the labor rec recruits were second or third sons. Next. However, the reality for those first Japanese immigrants was definitely not fields of gold, but rather extreme poor living conditions, as you can see from this slide. Next. This slide features the original government contract agreement between the Hawaiian Kingdom and Japan in 1885. It was called Kanyaku Imin in Japanese and first ship immigrants in English. I was able to take this photo when I made an appointment at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan a few years ago. This started the mass immigration of Japanese to Hawaii. Next. There were 26 shiploads of contract laborers under the agreement with King Kalakaua and the Hawaiian Kingdom. By 1924, there were over 200,000 Japanese nationals in Hawaii from many prefectures in Japan. And as this photo shows, many women labored in the fields as well. Next. This is an example of a labor contract featuring meager pay working for 26 days a month for 10 hours a day that consisted of years of backbreaking labor intensive work, clearing and land, digging ditches, planting, fertilizing, weeding and harvesting cane. Fair employment wages to be able to make a decent living and safe working conditions would take some time. Next. One man from Hawaii's immigrant history helped fight for the rights of Japanese sugar cane plantation workers 133 years ago. His name was Katsugoto. On October 28, 1889, Japanese immigrant Katsugoto was lynched and killed because he fought for the rights of Japanese sugarcane plantation workers. Next. I wrote a graphic novel about him titled Hamakur Hero, A True Plantation Story because he was also the victim of a violent hate crime, a victim of the push and pull factors of immigration around the world that happened in the past and is still going on now. Uh, next, please. After his three-year contract was completed, he opened up a general store. Because he spoke English, uh, Goto became the liaison between the Japanese laborers and plantation management. He advocated for improved working conditions and wages. He facilitated mediation and served as the interpreter. When the Japanese workers ran into a problem, they would seek out his help. So, and he was a community leader. Next. One night in October 1889, Goto met with a handful of Japanese workers. He was trying to help them because they were accused, accused of setting fire to the sugarcane fields and they were fined a large amount of money for breaking their contract. When he left the men at night upon his horse, he was lynched and his neck, head and neck were severely injured. Next. Then he was hung on a telephone pole in Honoka'a town and he died. He was found hanging on the morning of October 29th, 1889. Although he was just 27 years old when he died, his death marked a turning point for plantation laborers in Hawaii. He had planted the seeds of justice and labor rights in the hard soil of Hawaii's plantation society built on colonization. Uh, slide, next slide. But it wasn't until the mid 1940s that unions first formed in Hawaii. The union movement was designed to bring more economic and political resources to working class families in Hawaii. The movement was spearheaded by the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, the ILWU, which fought to organize workers on pineapple and sugar plantations. Next. In the past, all the islands in Hawaii had sugarcane growing on acres and acres of land. However, as labor costs increased and less costly sources of sugar increased, they all shut down one by one. This is a photo of the last sugar plantation in the state, which was Alexander and Baldwin's Hawaiian Commercial and Sugar Company that closed down in 2016 in Pu'u Nene on the, um, on the island of Maui. Next slide.
please. Although great strides have been made by unions towards more equitable and sustainable employment, it is still a battlefield field for the agricultural and tourism industries in Hawaii. Much of the tourism industry work is being done by new immigrants still arriving from Asia and the South Pacific. Vigilance is needed to ensure that sustainable economic growth and full productive employment and decent work for all continues to be a reality for Hawaii's workforce. This is a photo of a famous beach in Hawaii, Waikiki Beach on the island of Oahu, during the July 4th canoe race in 2019. Yes, before the pandemic. Slowly starting to, to get back though. <laughs> Next slide. But I want to also share another significant piece of Japanese American migration history. Although this piece of history happened 80 years ago last month, it has continued relevance today in light of the COVID related hate crimes against Asians and Pacific Islanders since the pandemic started. I am bringing attention to Executive Order 9066 issued by President Franklin Roosevelt on February 19, 1942 about two months after the United States entered World War II with the bombing of Pearl Harbor on Oahu in Hawaii by the Japanese. Next. Strictly based on race and with no evidence about whether the Japanese in America had any connections to Japan, about 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry were forcibly taken from their homes, forced to shut down thriving businesses, and they were relocated and incarcerated in internment camps. They were much like concentration camps in World War II in Europe. Most of them lived on the Pacific coast, but there were many leaders of Japanese ancestry taken from Hawaii as well. Note the tags attached to the mother and child. It's very dehumanizing. Next. Approximately two thirds of the internees were United States citizens. They were stripped of their citizenship rights, rounded up and placed in internment camps in barracks that were in the most remote, barren, desolate locations in the United States, surrounded by barbed wire as if they were criminals. So yeah, they were, they were, locate, they were moved to these desert areas in the United States. And I also wanted to show a three minute news clip about uh, this, 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 this incident that happened 80 years ago, because last month, you know, it was the 80th anniversary of this order. But, um, you know, I understand that maybe we probably can't see it. And I will give you the um, videos. Yeah, videos give it a try. Maybe, okay, maybe, we can, maybe we can give it a try. Uh -huh. Let me see. Oh, there, this one we can watch, looks like. La situación en la frontera entre Bielorrusia y Polonia es muy grave. Miles de niños y niñas están en situación crítica. Okay, let's see. Okay. We begin this half hour with an infamous anniversary. 80 years ago today, in the wake of the attack on Pearl Harbor, President Franklin Roosevelt signed an executive order that led to the forced relocation of more than 100,000 Japanese Americans. Their homes were seized, their businesses shuttered, and they were placed in internment camps. Many were held for nearly three years. It was one of the darkest chapters in U.S. history. Nancy Chen spoke with survivors who have spent a lifetime trying to move past their anguish. Inside the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles, a reminder of where Mas Yamashita spent his childhood. And these would be barbed wire fences, and they were a lot higher. To keep people inside? Oh, yes. That's me. Yamashita was just six years old when he became one of the 120,000 Japanese Americans on the West Coast deemed a threat after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Rounded up by the federal government, they were sent to internment camps where most would stay until the end of World War II. The Army provided housing and plenty of healthful, nourishing food for all. The executive order came from President Franklin Roosevelt, signed on February 19th, 1942. What does Executive Order 9066 symbolize to you? It was all based on racism. 
Most of those locked away were U.S. citizens, hauled off to harsh landscapes. The U.S. government built 10 internment camps, or as they called them, relocation centers. The evacuees cooperated wholeheartedly. The many loyal among them felt that this was a sacrifice they could make in behalf of America's war effort. The reality, say those who lived it, was far different. The dirt was all brown, the barracks were all black, and the sky was always gray. There's no color except black, brown, and gray. Juno G. Burke's parents tried to shield their family. They felt like, what did we do wrong? We did nothing wrong. Uh, they just wanted to live a peaceful life. They were Americans. Right. And this happened to right. Americans. Right. No Japanese American was ever charged for espionage, and it took the U.S. government more than four decades to apologize. It was based solely on race, for these 120,000 were Americans of Japanese descent. The people that wanted to come back to California were not allowed to. They still said no Japs allowed. The trauma would impact generations, including Yamashita and his daughter Tracy. I had turned my back more or less on the Japanese community for many years. And uh, it's taken me this long to embrace it and be really proud because relaying the story of the immigration and the uh, war and the camp experience um, has... <sighs> It's kind of helped him face some of his own demons. And now, as fewer survivors can share their experiences, recent violence against Asian Americans has added urgency to their mission. What is the importance of learning from history? Not to repeat it. A legacy and lesson, however painful, to remember. For CBS Saturday Morning, Nancy Chen, Los Angeles. Okay. Hey, um... Let's go back to the slides. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So next one. Yes, next one. Yes. Um, I know that maybe it was hard to hear and understand, but at about two minutes, 35 seconds, the internment survivor, Mas Yamashita says, you know, I turned my back on the Japanese American community for many years, and it's taken me this long to embrace it and be really proud. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I hope you learned a little bit more about this invasive and unjust internment for Japanese Americans. And um, I want to go back to what he says because it's very significant. You know, I turned my back on the Japanese American community for many years, and it's taken me this long to embrace it and be really proud. I want to emphasize this because essentially what happened was a termination, a stop in Japanese culture and language for Japanese people in the United States. You know, many families threw away important cultural items or buried them in their backyards because, and they wanted to protect themselves and their families from being associated with Japan. So they stopped speaking Japanese and stop practicing their culture. You know, they wanted to remove themselves from their culture and language as much as possible. And, uh, you know, this this is a tragedy. I believe in cultural sustainability and was, this was the opposite of that. That's why the following generations of Japanese in the United States cannot speak the Japanese language and might be removed from their culture. For example, you know, the Japanese who migrated to South America, to countries such as Brazil, Peru, Argentina, you know, they were able to retain their language and culture more because, uh, because they didn't go through this. The next slide, please. Um, but I just wanted to say that things were a little bit different in Hawaii. Although there were over 160,000 residents of Japanese ancestry in Hawaii, only a small percentage 2,270 Japanese were sent to the internment camps. Unfortunately, they were the leaders and the teachers of the Japanese community. Um, because if all 60, 160,000 Japanese were sent to the internment camps, with many working in the sugar industry, you know, the sugar plantations, the economy would have collapsed. So Hawaii's longest and largest uh, 
operating internment camp that opened in 1943 and closed in 1946 was located at Honouli Uli on Oahu Island. Um, next slide, please. Thus, in Hawaii, the chance for cultural sustainability was much greater. There were many Japanese language schools that taught students after regular English school. And I myself went to afternoon Japanese class every day until the eighth grade. Um, next slide. Obon is a time to honor one's ancestors who have passed on by having large dance celebrations. It's a group dance with coordinated movements to songs. The tradition may be somewhat similar to the celebration of the Latin Day of the Dead. Um, I, I, my pronunciation, the Dia de los Muertos. The Japanese, <laughs> the Japanese Obon dances are very popular in Hawaii. Uh, next slide, please. And it's, a and it's a celebration not just for people of Japanese ancestry, but for everyone, young and old, of all backgrounds and cultures, you know, dress up in summer kimonos for, for this Obon festival. Um, next slide, please. In fact, many Japanese customs seem to be practiced more in Japan, uh, more in Hawaii than in Japan. There's a bit of this frozen in time situation you know, where Japan has developed into a very modern, technology-rich country, Hawaii's Japanese cultural traditions are frozen in the Meiji and Taisho periods when the Japanese immigrated to Hawaii. So it's an interesting situation. You know, while many cultural traditions, um, Japanese cultural traditions, are only now practiced in the rural countryside of Japan, they are widely celebrated and practiced by um, everybody in Hawaii, in the cities of Hawaii. Next slide. Um, such as pounding steamed rice into mochi cakes with wooden mallets during New Year's. This is likely only done in the countryside of Japan, while many people in Hawaii still practice mochi pounding. Um, next slide. Um, here's a close-up of the mochi being pounded and women, women forming them into rice cakes. Um, they are often grilled and eaten with soy sauce and or placed into New Year's soup, a soup that you must eat on New Year's morning. Uh, next slide, please. The push and pull factors of migration bring fortunate and unfortunate consequences. Uh, migration outcomes can sustain culture or terminate culture. Let's continue to do our part in um, creating a more equitable society that seeks cultural preservation, cultural sustainability, and social responsibility. All of us, no matter what color, shape, or form, need to practice social responsibility to help create a more equitable and just society and world. You know, we are all one people living on one planet, facing the universal truths of love, joy, family, survival, pain, suffering, struggle, hope, and life. Uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention and on my topic today that focused on the Japanese American migration experience to Hawaii using a few major points in our history. I hope that we may have the chance to meet again as we celebrate global, global cross-cultural relationships. Um, the next slide, please. So Hawaii, um, no, no, the, the other one, ah, yeah, okay. which one, yeah, the beach one. Yes, this yeah, one. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> so um, you saw this photo of a crowded Waikiki beach during a sunny, beautiful day earlier in my presentation. Um, next slide. But um, my last slide features a photo taken at the top of Mauna Kea after a snowfall just before the new year, this new year 2022. Um, there I am at the bottom left corner. Yes, there is even snow.